Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our presentation. Really excited. We've got a couple more people here that are popping in. Um, we're going to be learning about dementia care around the world with Dr. Chris Johnson just momentarily. So um, let's give it one more minute while we've got a couple of folks coming in. Let's see here. Lauren, do you want me to mention a little bit about our program to them? Uh, Absolutely. I think that would be just fabulous. So right. I'll kick it off quickly with, um, again, everyone, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, we will have you chat in any questions that you have throughout the presentation. So on the bottom of your Zoom bar, there's a bubble that says chat. Feel free to check there to be able to type in your questions and also for contact information for Dr. Johnson and myself. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up for questions and answers. And at that time, I welcome you to unmute yourselves if you would like to directly ask a question or again, use that chat feature. Um, couple of quick things about Belmont. Um, so I'm with Belmont Village Lincoln Park. My name is Lauren Hollish. I am our community relations um, associate here. And so I oversee um, some of our kind of marketing and outreach educational events. And I work with families that are going to be looking into options for their loved ones. Um, here at Belmont Village Lincoln Park, we have three levels of care, true assisted living where we've got 24 hour on-site nurses and caregivers, three meals a day. Um, we've got a circle of friends program for mild cognitive impairment within assisted living that I'll, I'll bounce back to in a moment. And then we have a secured memory setting called a memory neighborhood. And um, between those three levels of care, we are able to have residents age in place. Um, we've been open for a year here and really that circle of friends program is to provide routine and structure for folks that have early stages of memory loss. Um, it provides eight hours a day, seven days a week of programming that was gerontologist developed um, by Beverly Sanborn about 10 years ago using some research from some of the top um, medical campuses across the country like UCLA, Rush, Northwestern. Um, and that being said, you know, we now in the COVID world are still continuing to run our programs. We just have masks and a little bit more social distancing. Our residents are dining in our dining room and we are probably the only uh, assisted living on the north side of Chicago that hasn't had any resident cases of COVID yet. So our families are able to come in the building to visit uh, seven days a week, um, scheduled in advance, of course, but um, we sanitize between visits and um, we're still looking at creative ways to get our residents, um, you know, involved with the community. So this Thursday, we actually have a local ice cream truck coming by that we are helping um, fundraise a, um, some funds for a new generator for the ice cream truck that's been around for 40 years and, um, you know, kind of bringing the community to our residents to keep them safe. So. Um, that being said, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Chris Johnson, who um, I'm going to let him talk about his accolades, some of the work he's done before he dives in. Um, but he has more than 30 years of experience in the field of gerontology um, with an emphasis on dementia studies. And he really is truly an expert in this field. Um, he's currently a clinical professor of sociology and a major contributor to the Masters of Science in Dementia and Aging Studies at Texas State University. So we're so fortunate to have him here today to tell us more about, um, you know, the program that he is running and also the amazing work that he's done. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Johnson, to talk about dementia care around the world. Um, take it away. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here today to share with you uh, a little bit about dementia around the world uh, care partnering projects. We call it care partnering instead of caregiving. Uh, and that's kind of the new uh, nomenclature we use uh, because they give to us too. So we are partners in care with persons with dementia. Um, 
my background, and very quickly, uh, I was for 25 years, I was director of gerontology at uh, University of Louisiana. We have uh, a, a program that is in the top 15 in America uh, as a gerontology program, but I knew something was missing and that was dementia uh, in the program. And so uh, for several summers, we shared students and faculty with Stirling University in Scotland, which has a PhD in dementia and studies. And there are uh, 35 dementia studies programs around the world and until now, uh, none in America, but uh, Texas State now offers the first uh, master's program online in dementia studies in America. Um, so I came here from Scotland. Uh, I was spending two years there while my wife was getting her PhD in dementia studies. And um, uh, we found that the UK is light years ahead of us in dementia care and, and care partnering. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of what uh, is going on, uh, some exciting things here in America and then also around the world uh, in the area of dementia studies. So <clears throat> uh, what you have, uh, you know, at Texas State, uh, here is our faculty. Uh, we have faculty, uh, very global faculty from China, from uh, the UK, from uh, you know, uh, many, many different countries uh, that represent uh, dementia care uh, in, in different part, uh, countries. And um, one of the interesting things is Texas State is where LBJ, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, went to school. And uh, he is a leader in American human rights. And we are the leading dementia education university in America. And um, and we emphasize human rights for persons with cognitive disabilities. So uh, on, the, on the right here, you can see a doctor, a medical doctor, Dr. Green, who um, uh, lives in Austin. And Dr. Green, uh, we're in San Marcos, which is just 30 miles south of, of uh, you, everyone knows UT in Austin, but Texas State is 40,000 students in San Marcos, and we're 30 miles south of Austin. So uh, Dr. Green is from Austin, he has Alzheimer's and uh, he retired from his medical practice, but he's now talking and sharing about his experience with Alzheimer's with people. And he's talking at our annual healthcare conference in San, uh, San Marcos that we have every year. And we have such people as Dr. Powers. Uh, some of you know that he's uh, a, a leading geriatrician in America uh, in dementia care and uh, has written Dementia Beyond Drugs, a wonderful book um, uh, that attacks polypharmacy and uh, the misuse of medications with older people uh, and particularly people with dementia. Um, so here you see worldwide uh, the multiple number of dementia projects, very interesting projects uh, in Ireland, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Ireland, you know, Peru, Israel, um, you know, the, uh, some are social, most of these are social uh, models of care projects. But in America, we overemphasize medical care to, and, and very little research or very little funding goes to social models of care. And we're, we're all, we're, we're totally, the funding is totally after a cure and we're promised by medical schools that we're, they're soon to get a cure. And, and of course that's important, but the social model of care is extremely important. And it's, we, we need to keep people in their uh, own homes as long as possible and, and provide uh, better uh, adult day services in, for persons with cognitive disabilities and uh, better uh, long-term care in nursing homes and assisted living that really is person-centered uh, in its approach. So we need early screening for dementia and uh, we need uh, you know, better uh, uh, ways to provide rights for people with this disability. So back in the year 2000, uh, we published, my wife and I, uh, who's a geront gerontologist as I mentioned, we published an article called uh, Alzheimer's Disease is 
a trip back in time. And it, it basically shows how the disease goes. It doesn't work neatly in stages. Uh, they actually go back and forth through time. And so this, uh, th this article was embraced uh, not only by the American Journal of Alzheimer's uh, in 2000, but also uh, the British Alzheimer's Society published, had us publish a short version of this for care partners, caregivers uh, in the UK. And we did an updated article on this in 2018 in the Journal of Behavioral Science, in which we uh, change a lot of the, we're moving away from uh, the idea of dementia as tragedy uh, to dementia as disability. Whole new way of thinking. Um, and uh, so uh, we had uh, Dr. Alan Powers uh, do a seminar to launch our dementia studies program at Texas State. And he, as I said, the book Dementia Beyond Drugs talks about social engagement. Uh, getting people involved in work, uh, uh, you know, people with dementia in work that they love, uh, that's safe but engaging, um, and um, music and all types of hobbies that they had in their life histories. Uh, church music is very important to a lot of persons. Uh, you know, uh, so, we, we, we need to know about the history of people who have dementia. And uh, dementia is a change in perspective that a person has. You know, the old definition is dementia is, uh, you know, a condition in which a person loses their, loses their ability to think, remember, and reason sufficient enough to carry out daily activities. Well, now we look at it as uh, more of a change in perspective that the person has. And you know, there are over 80 diseases that cause dementia. It's not just the Alzheimer's stereotype. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to understand the complexity, even in Alzheimer's. It's not old timers disease as it used to be stereotyped, that it's all older people. I show a film to my class of a 32 year old woman who has Alzheimer's uh, and as pregnant. And uh, her husband's commenting about, now I have two people to take care of, to care for. Uh, it happens as early as age 28. So, uh, and in terms of the trip back in time, as I'll point out in, in a later uh, uh, talk on this, uh, younger people actually go through the trip back in time quicker than older people. And, and that's another very interesting aspect of time travel. Um, so medical models in, in, uh, predominate in the United States and, uh, our program is attacking, uh, w we are for medicine, but, uh, a geriatrician, uh, once said, Dr. Robert Butler, he defined a geriatrician as a doctor who takes elderly off medications other doctors prescribe. So a medication is not a first line of action. It's a last line of action. And you're looking at all the, fa all the factors that affect a person's memory uh, and their behavior. Um, so we value getting, you know, we, we want to see, a, we don't want to, to really fall into the problems we see in America. Um, we see Americans have ageism, which is prejudice against older people. And so they devalue older people. They stigmatize people with dementia and, and aging. Uh, they, they believe that everybody that ages get, eventually gets dementia, which is not true. Uh, we have a hospital model that approaches long-term care and mass production of memory care. Um, we provide uh, medical nursing care, but fail to recognize and cultivate other aspects of life and well-being. These are all things that Dr. Uh, uh, Powers and, and later Dr. Thomas, who started the Eden Alternative, uh, have promoted changing uh, of these, these patterns in America of overly medicalizing dementia care. So Scotland has uh, uh, many different programs. This is actually where I worked in Scotland, in Stirling, Scotland, uh, the Iris Murdoch Dementia Center. And Iris Murdoch was um, uh, an English author uh, who got Alzheimer's and, and her husband 
after she passed away, her husband uh, donated money to develop this uh, Alzheimer's Center, which services all of Scotland. So I worked there for uh, two years and uh, was involved in training uh, throughout the island of Scotland and, and also uh, doing design education with architects in London, uh, which is part of the UK as well, as everyone knows. So uh, this was, um, you know, the, uh, a basic training center then in, in the UK and in Scotland. Uh, the UK has been a leader in dementia care. Uh, they started what's called personhood, which provides a lens for conceptualizing dementia practice and research. And it offers a rationale and language to improve care and raise consciousness of persons living with dementia as people, not patients. Uh, and they have worth and respect and we can't assume they can't learn anything. People with dementia can learn new information. Um, and personhood is essentially uh, a political concept concerned with psychosocial issues uh, that we sometimes restrict, keep people from fully uh, functioning when, when they have dementia. And we have to understand that each person has a life history and a biography that makes them unique. We can't stereotype all people with dementia as the same type of people. They have different life histories. Uh, dementia citizenship is very important in the UK and they pass laws. Uh, and now the, uh, their, the major airport, uh, Heathrow, uh, is now dementia friendly airport. There are dementia friendly cities, age friendly cities. You see little signs, elder crossings in neighborhoods. And it has a picture of an old man uh, with a cane. It's an elder crossing. Uh, isn't that lovely? I think it is. Uh, so, you know, uh, dementia citizenship is something that we want to provide here in America. And we're working very hard at Texas State to promote this idea. Um, so, Knowing the history of persons living with dementia is important. Uh, perceiving their care as a moral way of being, uh, developing expertise in dementia. The UK requires geriatrics in all of their, in their medical school. In the US, geriatric, our doctors take no geriatric courses. They are not required in, the, in, in America. Now, isn't that a bad deal? Uh, because older people, their metabolism changes with aging. And so you have issues of drug to drug and drug to food interactions that happen with older people. Uh, they're often prescribed the wrong type of medication, uh, one that doesn't move out of their system uh, quickly. And uh, so you have behavioral uh, challenges caused by medic polypharmacy the number of medications used sometimes, and the type of medication and the dosage of the medication. Uh, having a frame of reference to connect the person to their life history is very important and developing a strategy. And you learn this in the UK. Uh, so you have what we uh, also a growth of dementia cafes. And here I have a little film on just a very short one on a dementia cafe. It's just a social gathering for people um, living with dementia, trying to let them live well with dementia and also give some respite to carers. We don't charge, um, we try and get people active and they can do as much or as little as they want and it's just good fun. Well to win this award is absolutely incredible, um, it means an awful lot to the club, we've worked hard as a club, um, we've got a safe place, we have obviously the Tackling Dementia Cafe, stewards and staff or dementia friends and it's just an incredible honour. I've got a grandparent with uh, early onset dementia and short term memory loss, so it's something I'm pretty familiar with and I thought well it'd be nice to, to get involved. I think it's just the way you approach people with, with dementia and, and how you talk to them and how you behave around them. You know, a lot of the time they don't know who they are, so you have to sort of remind them of, of who they are and what they're doing. And, and just, you know, they're like anybody else, they just want to have a bit of fun. And a lot of them are active people in, in you know, before uh, dementia came along and just trying to keep them active. 
you know, to win the award in such a short period of time is, is huge. And um, yeah, Simon and his team should take a lot of credit and, and be very proud of what they've achieved there. Isn't that interesting? Holland uh, has developed, developed the world's first dementia village, which addresses stigma, loss of identity, and human rights. And uh, uh, part of uh, Ajwe uh, Care Center, it, it's a group of houses like a village, and a specially designed village with 23 houses for persons living, 152 persons living with dementia. And uh, these persons all need nursing homes and live in houses differentiated by lifestyle. Uh, so people live together with other people sharing the same ideas and values in life. Uh, this makes the place where one lives a home and they already lived where they shaped their own life prior to dementia. And so they have their own household and standards that uh, stay with them with dementia to a large degree. And the fact that a resident cannot function normally in certain areas being handicapped uh, by dementia does not mean that they no longer have a valid opinion on their day-to-day -day life and surroundings. So the resident's opinion on life, housing values and standards determine their lifestyle. So um, Holland's, uh, now we, we see these villages developing, I, I should have added France because they just uh, opened one. Uh, Switzerland, Germany, the U.S., um, and they have, at Hodgeway, they have them based on different lifestyles, and we need more research on how well that works, by the way, um, but they have urban, artisan, Indonesian, homey, uh, Joyce, cultural, and Christian, uh, which I think, you know, there are 38,000 different Christian denominations, so that could be a problem in itself. Uh, but at least they're making an effort to develop, you know, some way to engage uh, people with uh, who have born and raised in villages. Uh, now this, uh, we don't know how well this is going to work in America because there aren't these European type villages in America. So we don't know in, in terms of the trip back in time, whether this type of lifestyle is going to work well in America. I mean, a lot of people assume it is, but um, you know, uh, you know, these villages with streets, gardens, and parks uh, where uh, the residents can roam and so forth. We, we, we need more research on this. Um, Australia has three ways to make person-centered care work. Uh, they give a choice on how they feel at the moment. Um, so offering choices in yes or no uh, format for food at meal times or activities uh, rather than saying, are, are you hungry? What would you like to eat? That that's, uh, a more, requires more reasoning. Uh, whereas if they, you give them a choice of yes, no, uh, where they can, you know, it, it empowers them, but it gives them an easier way to answer correctly. Um, choice of showers or baths, time of day should be based on the biography of the person. Uh, some people like a bath, some people like a shower, some like it in the morning, some like it in the evening. Uh, whether, rather than warehousing the activity, uh, everyone takes a shower at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's based on their life history. Uh, so uh, that makes a little more sense. Um, and of course, how they dress and, and so forth uh, is based on their life history as well. Um, so you wanna see the world through their eyes, not your eyes. And so marginalizing persons living with dementia and disabilities is very common in the U.S. Uh, one uh, English so, uh, psychologist called it malignant social psychology. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the media in America that stigmatize aging with dementia. You see cards, uh, you know, that, well, you, you now hit, 65, are you hiding your own Easter eggs? You know, that sort of thing, you know, associating aging with dementia. Uh, one of the things that's interesting in Sydney, Australia are dementia cafes. Uh, again, here's what they're doing um, on them as well. So, welcome. 
Welcome to the 10th anniversary celebration today of the Dementia Cafe here at Kokoda. A very special day. Ten and a half years ago, 11 years ago, when we first thought perhaps we'll try and organise this idea of having this cafe where people with dementia and their family and friends could meet. They could interact with health professionals and people to answer questions and, and but mainly to make friends with each other and to support each other. We know that carers are really the hidden workforce of or hidden work part of the workforce of health because the role you play is significant. You're part of a huge team in our district. There are 53,000 carers who are actively supporting people. So a huge acknowledgement to, to all of you for the amazing work you're doing. So we've been married 57 years. Now, the last seven years have been a battle with dementia. I think the fact that people do keep coming back, that um, uh, you know, we have grown from the, the first cafe, you know, where we only had probably half a dozen uh, people coming along. The one we had last month, we had over 50 people. It's a, a social activity. Uh, if you're at home, you're a little bit introverted. Gwen does get introverted and depressed. But I think that if you go out and communicate with other people, it doesn't necessarily have to be people in the same situation. But this cafe provides that sort of community feeling to talk to people. It's all about the people. It's about the people who uh, um, attend the cafe. It's about the people who uh, assist. It's about the uh, proprietors of uh, the On Track Cafe. So I think you would all agree there's not many people that would let their cafe be taken over by a group like us. And yet these two have been very patient, they're very sensitive, they're very um, inclusive of all of us and are just so easy to work with. So thank you both very much. So this is very supportive here. You learn from other people what they've done and then you've got the care uh, service providers that come and give you help and tell you what's available out there, which you wouldn't know otherwise. The longest running cafe in the same place, you know, sort of in, in Sydney, there's, there's a lot of different cafes popping up in different places. Um, so I, I'm just really pleased that the local health district continues to support what we're doing here and, uh, you know, with events like today, you know, that, uh, you know, to me it was obviously great that we've been here for 10 years and it's nice to have the support through the district to say, yeah, this is something worth celebrating. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, The On Track Cafe that has set the benchmark on behalf of the carers and their loved ones. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, New South Wales Health. So one of the things that, um, you know, is important here, whether it be dementia cafes or the development of a dementia day service or daycare, uh, we don't call it daycare anymore, it's day service. Uh, we're developing a dementia day service in Georgetown, a uh, suburb of Austin. Uh, I'm involved in that project as well as my wife. Um, and it's um, a, a day service uh, where you can have either respite care or regular uh, day service and, and we'll be conducting research on better dementia daycare and day service. Uh, human rights and citizenship, understanding obligations and relationship uh, in relation to practice, reframing practice for civil rights. So um, part of that is more adult day services of respite and, and all day services geared toward persons with dementia. You're actually seeing some 24 hour day services now around the world. Um, and uh, that's for when people take trips and so forth um, and, and want to find care for their loved one. Uh, citizenship involves rights and power uh, given to persons with dementia. People that uh, some have been labeled as bossy have been bossy all of their life. It's not, that's a label. Uh, they're just, a, uh, you know, that's their personality. Uh, they're leaders uh, and it's not bossiness, it's their personality. And so understanding the personality of the person is part of their personhood. And uh, we, want that, we want to empower people that want power. Um, and uh, actually everybody wants power and, and uh, that's very important. 
so we want to end discrimination of people with uh, cognitive disabilities. We want to increase their status and lower the stigmas of them. Uh, some family members have actually abandoned people with dementia. They say, well, if my mom doesn't recognize me, what's the use of me visiting? But we don't say that with a child who has a disability. Uh, we find out how we can engage with them in a positive way, and we, can, we, we continue to visit them and participate in care partnering with them all the way through their life. Um, so uh, we, we don't want to exclude people uh, because they have a disability. Uh, and we're seeing very exciting things uh, going on around the world. Uh, you know, seeing dementia as tragedy is not very helpful. Uh, my mother had dementia. She had vascular dementia. She lived to age 99. Actually, uh, this is a picture of my mom right here. Uh, uh, when she was in uh, an assisted living memory care uh, toward the, uh, the very end of her life. Um, and it was very uh, an honor for me to participate in her activities. And when I would come visit, she lived up in Iowa and my younger brother, who's a lawyer, actually would call me all the time and he was her main care uh, partner. And uh, when I come up, I would actually stay in the assisted living uh, with my wife and we would get up early and participate with my mom and the residents uh, in activities. Um, so we want to, you know, I wanted to find ways to engage my mother. And uh, so I would, I would develop a, a picture book of pictures of the farm. No pictures of her sons because she was in a different time frame. She had time traveled back to her early stages of her life. So I wanted pictures of her dad and her sisters and the farm that she was raised, uh, that she grew up with. And so one of the important movements now uh, started in Japan and in France uh, called Humanitude. And um, it's a, a general care practice. Um, and it's a non-drug intervention, which is uh, a French origin metho methodology of caring for vulnerable elders with cognitive impairment. And it fo focuses strongly on building human relationships with persons with dementia. And that involves um, uh, the four pillars of relationships, gazing at the person with eye contact, making sure you have that eye contact, not standing over them, but standing next to them, looking them straight in the eye. Touch, speech, how you stand, all of those things are very important as nonverbal uh, ways to connect with people with dementia. And uh, so Humanitude standardizes certain communication skills for persons with dementia. She teach this in our classes uh, in dementia studies. And uh, we discussed the skill representation to evaluate the, the quality of caring uh, that goes on with people with dementia. So, um, and I just went over that. So uh, gaze is a, uh, a vertical uh, distance duration where the care partner gazes the elder's eyes for a long time at the front. And that way you actually engage, engage them. And then you have uh, how you talk to them is important. Um, the frequency, uh, the contents, et cetera. Uh, having a gentle voice, but loud enough that they can hear it if they have hearing impairment. Uh, touch to get their attention sometimes is important. Sometimes touch is not a good thing because some, uh, it depends on the life history, the personhood of each resident or each person living with dementia. Uh, some people like to be touched, some people don't. Uh, here's a little short clip on it to give you some idea. Every day we can create a new sense of hope. Through every moment we grow, we feel, 
we embrace, we care. Humanitude teaches immediately relevant techniques that benefit everyone. Four days reshapes years of training and brings real situation solutions that move us from care provider to friend. We are aligned and ready to apply humanitude directly into our everyday. Together, let's increase the quality of life for our residents, holding to our common purpose to create happiness by providing the finest living experiences anywhere. I think that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, another thing is um, uh, Cameron Camp is a gerontologist from Louisiana, uh, and uh, he uh, developed Montessori uh, for people with dementia in the United States. And we're actually developing that uh, Montessori program at an experimental dementia home uh, we're involved in in South San Marcos called Tapestry, and our, our researchers are going to be involved in, in this, uh, in studying different methods of Montessori with people with dementia. Clark Retirement Community is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We have over 400 residents that are part of our continuum of care. We are currently doing our Montessori program in our assisted living community. In May of uh, 2015, our board adopted a strategic plan that was about a year and a half in the making and a instrumental part of that strategic plan was around dementia and the dementia services we provide here and our commitment to dementia services out in the community. I was invited to attend a uh, think tank in Washington, D.C., put on by Leading Age, uh, the national organization, and that's when I met Jennifer Brush and heard her speak on uh, this thing called Montessori for older adults with dementia. And I was intrigued, impressed, and wanted to know more about how that could interplay with our residents at Clark. And um, that resulted in a meeting with Jennifer coming to Grand Rapids, meeting with some of our staff, meeting with our team. Uh, and so today, as we look at Montessori at Clark. It's really a way of living, a way of uh, uh, bringing uh, a different purpose uh, for our residents and for our staff. Montessori for Aging and Dementia is a philosophy of life that focuses on creating an environment that supports and empowers older adults to be as independent as possible and to have a meaningful life no matter what their age. It's a philosophy that's based on the work of Dr. Maria Montessori, who believed that education is not acquired by listening to words, but by experiencing one's environment. We've combined Dr. Montessori's knowledge of individuals' needs uh, throughout their lifespan with the, what the current research says are best dementia care practices. The result is a physical, social, and organizational environment that lets people experience joyful engagement in life. Many of the materials that Dr. Montessori designed to use with children at different abilities can be used in an adult manner to help elders maintain or improve their concentration, their ability to sequence, their fine motor skills, which in turn can be used to help them function better at meals or have greater success with dressing, for example. So one of the things that we have implemented here at Clark with our Montessori program is the use of our green name badges. We have them for the staff, our volunteers, and our residents. And what this allows the residents to do is be able to call us by name. Another thing that I've noticed about the positive impact that Montessori has had with our residents is that it's created this sense of community between the residents. 
I'll set somebody up with an activity like our seashell matching and another resident will come over because it's interesting and they'll work on it together. What we've really noticed as well is the residents are becoming accustomed to helping and that when they see us doing something they'll ask us well, what can I do to help you you know what can I do to help and so it's been really exciting to see that change in them to say it's okay to help they look forward to getting up in the morning and going to tend to their gardens um, their caregivers you know when when they didn't have me to care for anymore they put all their love into their pets and their plants and having the plants to be something to care for and to love has been wonderful for them. Um, getting out every day and working in a garden and bending down and plucking dead flowers and uh, not only is it mentally good for him but it's physical exercise that he wasn't getting. So I think you get the drift um, uh, is learn about their life history and then engage work activities they like to do, raking, uh, sweeping, folding laundry, folding church bulletins, being involved in, in a meaningful work activity. Every, a lot of people like to work. It's not uh, an all play. And then some people enjoy uh, leisure activities uh, throughout their life. And so in finding out about that person's life history is so, so important. And here's a project in Sweden, uh, which uh, they rank highest in elder care in the world um, uh, and, and very high uh, life expectancy. Uh, IKEA has developed uh, a housing uh, for persons uh, with dementia and it's called uh, Selviabo Homes, uh, residential sites. And uh, this gives you, uh, here's a picture, another picture of it. Uh, you notice the greenhouse there. Uh, a lot of people love greenhouses and, or flowers or gardening. Uh, they've done it all their life. And so it's very important to engage them in, in activities they've been involved in. A uh, recent thing too is our, our uh, engineering department is involved in um, robotics and dementia eh, and uh, at Texas State. And here is uh, something that was developed in Japan and its name is PARO and it's a biofeedback seal. some reason there's two of these up. <laughs> Even if Bobby is a robot, he's made so that he can he can Sorry be up to that. anybody and he reacts to me. But when I saw Bobby, I took him oh I did love him straight away. He has lots of senses so it's very responsive. If you hurt him, he knows that it's bad and he will also reflect how people behave to him. For people that Even like freedom, that doesn't answer, do you think you want to stop in the back video? It can, it can be up to anybody. It's had a really amazing me. impact where she's wanting to come out more that? and, you know, interact with the seal. She she will say that she eats better, which in turn, then she now? sleeps better. Do you think you can stop both of Her well-being and life, which is, is improved due to Paro. Yeah. Okay, um, what, I'll just explain it, or, or uh, do, do you have a suggestion, Lauren, on this? No, I, I'm not sure exactly the, um, the tech issue. Thank you all for bearing with us on that. I think, let's have you just explain it and we can. Um, yeah, um, this okay. is a biofeedback seal and it basically um, uh, measures uh, their, uh, their temperature and see if they their blood pressure, it, it um, it has a number of different functions. Uh, its eyes move, um, it, it, uh, they like to hold it, um, and it's actually covered by Medicare. Um, so uh, the seal has a number of different, um, you know, uh, very positive functions that, that it, it will do. 
And so we're looking at, um, uh, you know, some people say, well, robots, uh, you know, are not necessarily, you know, are, are so impersonal. But uh, when you have a robotic cat or robot, robotic dog, uh, when a person has time traveled back to earlier stages of their life, the very earliest stages of their life, uh, that can become very real to them. Um, so they actually love it and they engage with it. And that's what is important to us is being in fully engaged uh, socially. And so we are studying robotics and uh, that's uh, in, in a number of different ways. There are robots in Japan that lead people to the dining room. Uh, and it's worked very well for them. Uh, so we're, we're, we're studying different aspects of robotics. That's a very lengthy <laughs> lecture in, itself, in and of itself. Uh, so uh, I wanna leave it open for questions if anyone has it. Uh, this is information on our program. Uh, I have my email at the front, uh, cjj38 at txstate.edu. Um, and information on our Dementia and Aging Studies online program, uh, master's program. Um, I, and so uh, I know some of you are gonna have some questions uh, in regard to uh, this presentation. So let's leave it open for that. Yes, so the first question I have from the chat feature here is, um, do you find the touch factor is also dependent upon who they were before their di dementia diagnosis? Um, if they liked touch before, would they after? You know, have you seen correlation with that or know anything um, regarding yep. kind of that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it starts out in childhood. Some children are, have been labeled touch-me-nots. <clears throat> Others are in your lap all the time, always wanting to be held. Uh, it's true among in animal life, it's true in human life. Uh, you have a great variation in personalities uh, with people. And um, if, if they have not been a real touchy, holdy type person their whole life, why would that change dramatically in, in uh, elderhood? or with when, when they have uh, dementia. Uh, so you have to learn their life history and their personality. Uh, some people are, are leaders. Uh, they get labeled bossy by prejudiced people, but leaders, uh, they've been leaders all their life. So we give them more empowerment. You know, they, they might want to help, help set the table or help, uh, you know, in, in different tasks. So learning their personality is important. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And um, one of the other questions we got was, how can we help communicate these changes to administration? It seems that changing the culture from medical to social is received with some resistance. Um, any input on that? Well, medical is a quick fix uh, for behavioral, quote, problems. We don't call it behavioral problems. Uh, we call it behavioral challenges. And there is a cause of all behavior. So finding the cause of the behavior, and this is a training module I do, uh, finding the cause of behavior is very important because it's an unmet need. We, we, we have to identify the unmet needs of persons with dementia instead of medicating them for a quick fix. Texas leads the nation in the misuse of psychotropic drugs in nursing homes. And it's because they're looking for a quick fix. Now our program already has made an impact on Texas because they're no longer leading in that category <laughs> because they're learning about social engagement and personhood and the life histories of people and their unmet needs. So important to engaging a person in care partnering. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that there are so many resources you walked through today um, that are around the world. Can you tell us a little about any other um, resources that currently in the United States are being built or kind of beginning to take um, to take precedent in the United States? Have you seen any kind yep. of communities being built? 
Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> there are, uh, there is a dementia village in California that's being built. Uh, I question it because, uh, you know, again, we're not built on European models of villages and that doesn't match up well with the person's time travel. Uh, but we're building, uh, uh, we're involved in a place uh, called Tapestry in South San Marcos uh, that's um, continuing care retirement community. And um, it's very, um, we're going to be researching light, sleep, um, uh, different types of uh, activities that I've showed in this, in this film and what, how to improve those types of activities. Um, we have the, the greenhouse movement that started with Dr. Uh, Thomas, who did the Eaton Alternative. Very interesting geriatrician. Um, uh, Life Worth Living is a great book if you want to read it by Dr. Thomas. He's a friend of mine and uh, started uh, engaging. <clears throat> He's a geriatrician from Harvard. And the first nursing home he was in, um, he noticed the uh, elderly were on all these medications and they were lonely and they were bored. So he, and he started what's called the Eden Alternative, back to the Garden of Eden. Plants, pets, children, uh, social engagement. <clears throat> and it was great. After a year of the Eden Alternative, he measured their medications prior to Eden and then a, a year after, and it cut their medications in half. Think of the amount of money that would save the American government if we learned the social models of care in living in various types of settings, whether it be in the person's home or adult day service or assisted living. Yeah. And, you know, another great kind of question um, that we got was, um, you know, thinking about the challenge really behind kind of making a shift in the U.S. is the regulations set forth in facilities that are focused on a medical model. Um, and this person is wondering how facilities are managed differently in other co countries and if they have any issues with their own regulations and trying to kind of move forward with more of the social model and person-centered care. Regulations need to be made by people who understand dementia and social models of care. <clears throat> they're not, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not made by bureaucrats or medical doctors that have no training in geriatrics. Um, in the UK, uh, passing legislation to empower people with dementia was important. And so they passed acts uh, over two decades ago uh, for civil rights for people with dementia. And then they started design, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm fighting an allergy. It's okay. Um, they started, you know, uh, changing their cities, their airports, their buildings uh, to accommodate aging in place uh, for elder, you know, elders to be able to use uh, these places and for queuing uh, with, with people that have memory issues. So in America now, <clears throat> I'm involved in projects in Austin, uh, a dementia adult day service in Georgetown. We're involved in uh, this project in South San Marcos, uh, which will involve all these research into social models of care and empowering people. We're, we have um, we, uh, age-friendly city in Austin project and uh, dementia will be a very big part of that, not just with the city, but with the airport. Um, and, and making it very similar to uh, Heathrow um, in London. So uh, we're beginning this process in America and I, I pointed out Cameron Camp's work um, and the, the work of Dr. Powers and Dr. Thomas. It's very exciting to see, uh, and, and they've all been to San Marcos where, where we are in Austin, um, uh, right next door. San Antonio has some very interesting projects going right now. Uh, so I'm very excited about some of the things that are happening in Texas. And certainly uh, uh, this is going to be a springboard for uh, social change throughout the United States. Absolutely. 
And I think we have one last question that's a little more general. So, you know, we talked very briefly that Sweden is highest ranking for elder care in the world. They've got very long lifespans. Um, what, wh what makes them the highest in the world? What makes them kind of the best of the best in elder care? Well, they've always been behind human rights. Um, I say that, but they, they made a really bad decision not to social distance and um, mask in Sweden. And they had the highest rate of COVID in Europe and Scandinavia um, because of it. Uh, so they have their problems. <laughs> they definitely do. Um, but um, they, they've always had in, in long-term care, uh, progressive nursing homes, progressive assisted living, and uh, have been very interested in, in, you know, empowering older people. And uh, so that's, you know, uh, so many of these countries are different from the United States in that they don't have that kind of prejudice of, of what we call ageism, prejudice and discrimination against people because they're old. Yeah, right. Or because they have a cognitive disability we have the Great Panthers that was started by Maggie Kuhn in America that got rid of the denture commercials uh, for older people. And we're changing commercials, um, trying to promote a, a different attitude about growing old. Maggie Kuhn was a, a game changer in, in America for human rights for older people. And the Great Panthers is a great organization that promoted rights for people with gray hair and wrinkles uh, that she said are beautiful. And uh, we, we don't have to look young. We're beautiful the way we are. And uh, that was a whole new way of thinking. It was similar to the Black Panthers said, black is beautiful. They're, they're beautiful the way they are. They don't have to look white. People that are old don't have to look young to be beautiful. Well, and that actually ties into another question that we just got um, that, you know, one of our attendees, um, you know, based on your presentation is making a note that this is really seeming like it's um, modeled towards European and European Americans. Um, and the question is, what might like this look like for communities of color? Um, any insight on that? Well, uh, communities of color are, we're all one race, the human race. Uh, but they're diverse as well. And so we have to take into account all ethnicities um, in, in the human family. And part of globalization, and, and which our program is all about globalization, in, a, in an era of nationalism and prejudice, we're about global, being global. And global involves America, and it involves the great diversity in America. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's even in my own family. I have a daughter that's black and a son that's Asian adopted. And uh, so I have a, what I guess would be called a United Nations family in my own family. So, uh, Amazing. It's, you know, it's so important when we plan programming to include the, uh, the, the unique experiences of African Americans, of Asian Americans, of Latino Americans, um, in, in our programming and, and in our personhood uh, in terms of our, our uh, social activities that are, that are planned. Uh, and that includes that, music. Yeah. I think that also the, um, the cultural differences of aging and really the last stage of life of passing play a little bit of a role. Um, you know, I, I, pres I recently attended a great CEU topic um, that was talking about um, cultural differences in like hospice care for end of life. Um, and yep. there are, you know, different cultures, um, specifically um, Hispanic cultures, for example, are um, more about that um, the whole family takes care of the um, yes. eldest person and, you know, the idea of moving them to a facility, for example, or even putting them in somewhere that the family is not the primary caretaker is really kind of not necessarily their um, culture as, as a general statement and um, had a really yes. good pre presenter talk about that. And I think that does play into, 
you know, looking at the Montessori model and how that applies in each of those different, um, you know, fabulous memory cafes and, you know, how that can be adapted a bit to provide um, opportunities for other cultures to, to really benefit from um, some good dementia care programs. There's quite a few ethnic cultures, uh, Asian, African American, where uh, they have the similar attitudes about going into nursing homes and stigmatizing nursing homes and assist, you know, assisted living and long-term care and to take care of your own family members at home. And so uh, we, we not only have to recognize that there are these different ethnic patterns in America, but then also recognize diversity within those ethnic groups. Not all black families are alike and not all Latino families are alike and not all Asian families are alike. And there's a lot of stereotyping in that direction as well. And, and that's one of the things we teach in our courses is this type of uh, cultural knowledge that's needed uh, by practitioners in our field of gerontology. Yeah. Being well, culturally I intelligent. I'm, you know, blown away by the amount of information that you have provided us with today. And I think that it's opened some eyes and minds to some amazing ways that, you know, we can think of um, approaching our loved ones with dementia. Um, and at this time, we actually don't have any more questions, but I did have um, some folks ask about if they'll be able to see a recording and I will have one for attendees to view um, so that if there's anything that you want to kind of listen back to, of course, you're welcome. Um, and everyone that got the email um, this afternoon reminding you about the event has Dr. Johnson's email in case you have any specific questions to talk through with him. Um, but I will give a round of applause myself and everyone behind their screens can give one to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much for sharing this amazing information with us and really, you know, giving us a piece of your brain today. Um, it's been wonderful and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you all at, at a future date. All right, we'll see you in probably a 2021 event, probably the, right. um, the trip back in time topic, I think we'll, we'll set up. So we'll hope to see you all there and I'll send you all a follow-up email after this. Thank you all so much for attending today. Bye-bye.